Absolutely. All right. Well, everybody, welcome back. Everybody's coming back to track B here to join us. I hope you had uh, uh, awesome and informative time at the other sessions. I know we had a lot of great speakers lined up. I can't wait to go back and hear and some of the stuff I missed today. Um, and with that, we're man, today has flown by. Flown hey, by. What, what an awesome conference and so awesome opportunity to, to bring everybody from Utah's manufacturing community together. We uh, really appreciate everybody who joined today. And we're going to turn the time over to our fearless leader, Todd, who is going to wrap this thing up for us and uh, close out the day. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, you know, I, I want to just make a few comments here. I don't necessarily want to be the guy that, uh, uh, you know, pontificates for 30 minutes between uh, between us and the end of the conference. But I thought it was uh, maybe appropriate to just make a few comments on on the state of manufacturing um, here in Utah. And, 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 you know, I don't need to tell anybody that's that's on the on the conference today that it's it's been it's been an interesting uh, spring, summer and now into fall. And uh, it's 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 just tough. I mean, it is, uh, it has been a trying time for a lot of different folks. Uh, I get asked nearly every day, what's the, what's the state of manufacturing? And, and I've said, pick a company, uh, because yeah. it, it, it changes from company to company as to where they are in the current situation, uh, how they've weathered, uh, the last nine months, uh, many have been up. Uh, and way up. Many uh, were put on hold for four months while things kind of sorted itself out in terms of who was a critical piece of infrastructure. Um, and uh, we're pleased to have been a part of that from the very beginning to uh, be uh, one of the first states in the country to go in and, and declare manufacturing as a critical infrastructure, an essential part of the economy. So before I start, I just want to say thank you to the manufacturers in the state. Thanks to the makers of products who truly what Utah makes makes Utah. And I can't imagine what would what the scenario would be right now if our manufacturers in this state had not been able to continue to operate, to produce the products, to drive the economy, uh, to be that industry that pays the second highest wage in the in the state and uh, for all of you that have that have uh, that have overcome obstacles that have repurposed that have retooled that have taken this challenge head on thank you uh, thank you for those citizens of the state that don't know they need to thank you uh, that uh, don't know what you've done to keep this economy going we were uh, commonly recognized over the last five, six years as the, the number one economy in the country and the most diverse economy in the country and the best managed fiscal state and all kinds of accolades. And those accolades are awesome. Um, the question today is where are we now? And, and what do we continue to do as an, as an organization, as an industry to, uh, to work our way out of this. We're still ahead of the curve on, on unemployment in Utah. Um, in fact, we're in many cases way, way ahead of the curve. Um, we were the first state in the nation to make some changes to unemployment law in Utah and uh, allow our companies uh, uh, to be able to deal with some issues there that was, was very critical. There's been some good legislation that's been passed over the last uh, several months that has helped us adapt to this. But we're not out of the woods yet. You know, as an organization here, uh, I want to give hats off to to Cedro and Ryan and the rest of our team at UMA and working with 20 companies across the state and producing 2.5 million masks for the citizens of the state of Utah. And uh, we as an organization unabashedly support the direction that we're headed in terms of social distancing and wearing of masks and limiting exposure and trying to get ourselves through this pandemic manufacturing needs to stay open uh, we need to yes, continue to drive the economy um, and we need to continue to be that engine that drives utah and in order to do that we want to be able to bring employees into the workplace every day and you as our companies want to send them home safe um, 
it's a it's a tough situation right now. I've I've got a mother in law in the hospital who's got COVID and pneumonia, and is battling uh, battling for her life. And uh, um, it's a tough time. It's a tough time. Everybody's got a story like that, and uh, everybody's had someone within their company who's been affected, a family or a loved one or a friend of a family or someone. Um, you know, uh, there's not a lot of normalcy going on right now. One of the things we've seen as we've talked with a lot of our companies is there's a lot of fatigue and there's employee fatigue, uh, there's emotional fatigue, there's physical fatigue. And you as companies know that better than anyone. Um, you know, again, thank you. Keep your chins up, keep, keep driving forward, keep working through this. And, and I'm, uh, I'm certain we're going to get through this. Uh, you know, production trends have been interesting. Um, as, as we alluded to in other calls, I just, uh, you know, in our previous call, uh, Clint uh, Morris with Lifetime jumped in and, and they're, they're three and four times over production what they have been. But on the, on the flip side, um, our chairman's company, Boeing, uh, there's not a lot happening in the aerospace industry. Um, the oil and gas industry has certainly been, has taken a hit. Um, I think we as an organization need to be uh, as an industry need to be cognizant to the fact that there there have been certainly winners and losers in this pandemic and we all need to reach out and try and figure out how to help each other get through this and and uh and we've learned some things from it i think we've learned that uh, there are some holes in our supply chain in the u.s and some things that we probably ought to be working on uh, to try and determine how we reshore some of those things and if and when there were a pandemic again that we need to be able to address that um, again, that's, that may be one of the positive positives from the pandemic. Maybe another positive for the industry might be that I think a lot of our companies have been addressing and determining how does virtual work, um, how, how does it function? Um, how do we measure success within our employees and what are the metrics we're using? How do we do reportability? How do we deal with connectivity? Um, you know, we as an organization, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've had uh, someone in our on our team working remotely for almost 10 years. Uh, so for us, we're kind of like, okay, well, looks like we're gonna have a couple people working remotely now. Yep. Um, but certainly in many of our industries, the subsectors of manufacturing working remotely is not possible. It's one of the things we early on went to the legislature and said that six feet in many cases is just simply not possible and we need to make sure we keep those things open early stories from this were um, governments that said well yeah if you're a company that ships bleach and produces bleach yes you can continue to do that but if you're a company that produces pallets you you need to close well we ship bleach on pallets um, and, and so I think what we learned early on is that the infrastructure and the supply chain in a pandemic matters, transportation matters, energy matters, all of those things, uh, railroad, um, uh, communication lines, all of those things. And we've been privileged as an organization to be a part of the critical infrastructure task force, as well as the economic uh, task force uh, for COVID and, and addressing how we get through this. Um, I think most of our manufacturers probably have the same type of view on this, is that uh, they're, they're, you're all working very diligently to control the spread of the virus. Um, kudos to all of you in temperature scanning um, and in uh, dealing with the, the control of the virus. We've, we've been out numerous times with epidemiologists and industrial hygienists helping companies determine what is the best way for us to keep our employees safe and keep our teams safe. And that has been um, significant. Um, now that's a service that we can provide for folks absolutely. too. If they're looking for a way to improve their safety, um, we can yeah. certainly help out with we that. We certainly still have that ability to do that. Yep. And if so, if you if you would like to to have our group come out and bring someone and help you look at a uh, at an infectious disease plan or uh, help train individuals on how to prepare for infectious disease, those types of things, we have the means to do that. Yeah, there's some funding available for that. So yep. just a heads up to anyone out there, if you're, if you're looking for help, you know, please reach out to UMA and we can, uh, you know, bring resources to bear to help you out. Exactly. You know, and then again, on the, uh, it, it's been, it's been a challenge looking at small manufacturers versus large manufacturers. 
Um, and uh, again, we know that there are companies out there that are that are struggling and we wanna do what we can to help you with that, whether it be from the production standpoint, uh, you know, we're, again, Ryan and Cedro have been doing a lot in terms of lean, eliminating waste during these times and looking at potential markets and additional markets, things like that. Um, on the political front, certainly it's been a tumultuous few months. Um, and uh, both as a, as a local organization here and as a national organization for the National Association of Manufacturers, I think we we look forward um, uh, to uh, the coming administration with some um, uh, some pause, but I think we're also going to be thinking about uh, how do we focus on on policies over politics, and that will be the focus both nationally as well as here in Utah. Is how do we focus on those policies that help move manufacturing forward? Um, how do we? remain the state that is the best managed state, the best state for business. Um, we want to do some more things to encourage incentive for existing manufacturers here in Utah, continue to remove barriers uh, from manufacturers continuing to, uh, to improve and grow. Uh, it's one thing to be recognized, as I indicated earlier, as the number one state to do business in the country. Um, but in order to maintain that ranking, we have to be aggressive as a state to keep moving forward. Um, kudos to companies like Lifetime that, that have worked with Senator Lee over the last three or four years to, to push forward on the Made, Ameri Made in America and Made in USA campaign, um, which is very important. And made in Utah. And made in Utah. Absolutely. Again, you know, um, Buying local and made in the USA, I think that may be one of the biggest positives that comes out of the crisis and the pandemic is that there is a resurgence in buying US made products. And as that wave comes, we as an, as a, an industry need to be prepared to be able to do that. We talked a lot about that today, our branding, our production, our marketing, our, our supply chain connectivity, all of those things that helps us as an industry be ready to move forward on those things. Um, maybe just lastly, a couple of things. One is uh, automation. I think uh, we're seeing, uh, we've been seeing automation as an enhanced productivity tool and uh, uh, certainly it, it will continue to be that. Um, we heard today and we've known this, that there is still a shortage of workforce and we still have companies that are needing to hire individuals today. Um, we heard it again yesterday as Ryan and I were out, a couple of companies said, we need more workers. Um, so um, as we continue down that road, we've been saying that for a number of years, a 2.7% a unemployment rate before the pandemic is a wonderful thing unless you're trying, trying to hire someone. Um, and then it, then it's horrible. But uh, I think we're sitting in the mid four right now or low fours for unemployment. And uh, again, we need to continue to work on talent acquisition and talent retention for the industry. And how do we drive today's generation into the career of manufacturing? How do we help them make it, uh, make it exciting, help them understand that it is challenging, it is an exciting field and the sky is the limit in terms of what their options are. So um, again, politically right now, uh, it is, uh, we are somewhat insulated here in, in the state. And uh, uh, as I travel around the country, my colleagues will always tell me what, what, what problems or challenges could you possibly have in Utah? Um, because they, uh, they kind of feel like, you know, you guys are number one in the, in the country, best managed state, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we have our challenges just like anybody else does. And, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work as an organization with our legislature and with our congressional delegation. Um, we are again in the process right now of working with uh, one of our US senators uh, to, to uh, redo, for those of you who may not have been back there, the the conference room at the Senator Lee's office is the Manufacturers Association Made in Utah conference room. And uh, we'll be coming to, to many of you to get a product to 
as we expand that and uh, adorn all of the walls in Senator Lee's office with products that are made here in Utah. Uh, so again, um, a lot of things happening in manufacturing, things are really good. Uh, at the moment, we, we need to continue to grow, work on our workforce issues. And, and again, just a big heartfelt thank you to the companies who, have, who are in the trenches every day, moving forward, digging, and, uh, and really helping us drive the economy here. Because it truly is uh, a fact that what Utah makes, makes Utah. So uh, guys, that's about all I have, unless there's any questions from anybody that wants to you know, throw a softball my way or, or uh, a rotten tomato, one of the two. You heard or, him, guys. Or a hardball. <laughs> or a hardball. You can throw a hardball. Yeah. Now's your chance to grill Todd. So, and we do. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. We want to make sure and get feedback from our uh, session today. One of the uh, principles of continuous improvement is learning from our uh, customers and, and making sure we're meeting your needs. So, we're looking for opportunities to, uh, to do that. Simplest way would be to drop us an email. UMA at umaweb.org. That's UMA at umaweb.org. Uh, make sure we get feedback and learn from that and those opportunities. So we appreciate uh, in advance feedback that you have for us. Now, um, I don't want to shortcut any questions. We do have a, another, there we go. Cedro's pulling that up right there. Um, but you can send us feedback. Uh, and uh, that way we, we have a, a session that we're going to do in conjunction with and on behalf of the Utah Industry Resource Alliance at the bottom of the hour. Uh, but before I build a bridge to that segment, we want to make sure and, uh, and see if there's any questions that anyone wants to pose. If you've got, um, if you put anything in the chat, uh, we'll discuss that. And uh, so while you're thinking of any questions, I'll go ahead and introduce what we're going to do at the bottom of the hour. We have, um, uh, we have five panelists who are going to join us on this. We have Talinda Larson, who's the director of UAMI, the Utah Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Initiative. Uh, we have Dave Winter, CEO of Lifetime Products up in Clearfield. We have Nathan Millicum, CEO of EP Systems up in North Logan. Uh, June Chen will be, man or will be uh, joining us from LDD Partners. And Johnny Ferry, VP of Business Development at Honeyville Incorporated, will be part of our panelists. And what we're going to talk about is the future of manufacturing. So this will be on a different link uh, that Cedro has uh, shown uh, up on the screen there. But it'll be a um, uh, it'll be a, a slightly variation. So it'll be zoom.us/my/uma2020. So that meeting will open up at the bottom of the hour. And uh, some of the topics we're gonna talk about include um, uh, what, is the, what does the future look like? What does industry 4.0 look like for your company? Um, Utah is doing uh, better than most areas in the country, but what risks do we have as manufacturing base? We're gonna talk about what are your international exporting plans? What do you plan to do as a manufacturing company to make sure you're growing in the international area? We're also gonna talk about COVID-19 and how you're dealing with that and impacting that. So our panelists will be able to provide some feedback for uh, doing this. And we appreciate uh, very much our partners with the Utah Industry Resource Alliance. Um, Steve Black up at uh, the University of Utah, who is the center director up there and our partners associated there. I think we've been able to add a lot to manufacturing here at Utah. And so we're going to do that in conjunction with them at the bottom of the hour. Let me just uh, comment that if anybody uh, on that web link that, uh, that Cedro put up on there, as we start our new uh, podcast series and our new video series, if there are some topics or individuals or entities you would like us to invite to be on, uh, be on the show or uh, interview them, please send us those uh, as we want to make sure that we are... Um, are addressing the issues that are pertinent uh, to you. Um, but we have some ideas and some things that we want to uh, want to talk about. But uh, again, this is this is your show and your organization. And so you want we want you to lead us uh, um, and direct us as to where, where we ought to be focused. Great. Let's turn attention to Mark uh, for a question here. He says, Todd, What's interesting at the technical college, uh, at the technical mm -hmm. colleges, the adult enrollment is down. Likewise, the number of hours they are taking. We are hearing that our industry partners are feeling the same effect 
of lower than normal applicants, how do we encourage adults to go back to work or school? That's a good question. We've been talking with our uh, with our eight college presidents for for over a year now on a campaign to try and focus on on veterans, uh, on refugees, and adult uh, adult learners. Um, one of the challenges that we have had, and it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg type of a ceremony scenario, is that we get individuals who come into those programs at the tech colleges. And before they can graduate, they're offered a job within the industry and, and they go to work for a company and sometimes don't, don't finish. Um, and, and that's in some ways is just the nature of the fact that we have a shortage of workers and companies are willing to say, we want, we want you to go through those programs and get that certificate. But quite frankly, we'd love to have you now before, before you finish. And, and I think most of our companies would say, Hey, come to work for us and continue to get those certificates while you are. But in some cases, uh, it doesn't happen. Um, it, it is an ongoing challenge from both an adult learner standpoint. We've even gone as far as to talk about how to create a charter school, possibly for refugees, um, that focuses on manufacturing. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, we're, I'm the chairman of a new charter school right now that we're in, we're, we're opening up in the near future, an online charter school, uh, in conjunction with petroleum and mining and biotech industries, uh, that will focus almost entirely on careers in those industries, an online uh, K through 12 school to try and figure out a mechanism to fill that pipeline with, uh, with individuals who want to go to work in, in the manufacturing and, and those industries. It, it's uh, something that around the country, many of our colleagues haven't been able to figure out either is how do you entice today's generation and, and others to go to work in an industry that pays significantly higher than many, in, many other industries. We're working with our tech colleges to try and figure out ways to do that. Love it. Love it. Um, great. Uh, yeah, the, a couple of the comments, just if you haven't seen your, your chat there, Kelly said, I imagine scholarship sponsor, scholarships and sponsorships would be a great motivator um, with, many, uh, with so many without jobs. Mark replies, thank you, Kelly. We have a number of, uh, number of uh, financial aid, uh, just no applicants. And, um, and Kelly responds, we have a shortage of job applicants. Didn't realize education had a hard time too. Thanks for that. Yeah. So great conversation. Yeah, and many, the, the, the public right? policy issues problem. around manufacturing are huge. Yeah, and many of our companies, uh, you know this, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir, but many, many of our companies do tuition reimbursement. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and they do so many different things. So part of our challenge is, is uh, marketing to, uh, to the job applicants, marketing to the parents, marketing to uh, a whole realm of individuals in the legislature to help them understand that these are, these are living wage jobs. These are jobs with marketplace relevance. These are not, these are not um, you know, $7 an hour jobs. We heard yesterday starting wage uh, between 14 and $19 an hour. Yep. Uh, and yep. that is very, it's very common. And they're, they're, they're cranking that up with uh, additional training. We were talking to another company that also just raised their starting to the 14 plus range. And their objective was to get people uh, closer to the 15, 16 within 60 days after they've accomplished the first six steps of training. So there's a, that, that's a big part of the market out there. If you have any additional questions, please shoot them over in the chat. If you have feedback on this conference, we sincerely uh, would like your feedback and would like to make sure that this conference is even bigger and better next time around. And in addition, if there are services that you need, if you're a small manufacturer, uh, we have uh, government funding to come in and help you out with your business, help you increase sales, not just lean manufacturing and increasing, increasing efficiency, but in, in growing your company, helping you with marketing, helping you with sales. Supervisor um, training. Supervisor yeah. training, right? Uh, training. Compliance yeah. training. If you need... Uh, ISO certification, AS9100 certification, anything like that that's going to help you grow your business and be more competitive, please reach out to Utah Manufacturers Association. We can help you, um, and we look forward to helping you. And, and as we've said throughout this conference, we are committed to helping connect and strengthen you as our, our manufacturing company. So thanks again for joining. Please stick around. We will be jumping to another session on a different link here in about five minutes. You can see it on my screen. It's zoom.us slash my slash UMA 2020. 
This is a, an open meeting that anyone can attend, and it will be a panel discussion on the future of manufacturing in Utah and U the United States and beyond. I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks, everyone, for your Thank participation. You. And, Thank you, Todd. And uh, thanks for your Thank involvement you, in the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Joey's our man behind, man the, behind screen. the screen. Yep, that's right. Here, let's do a, a great Oz. Screenshot of the man behind the screen. Here we go. Uh oh, no. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody.